Um, my name is Joe, and this is 100, or sorry, not 101, but 101 ways to brick your hardware um, with some unbricking tips mixed in for some good measure. Um, I am only one Joe. I am Joe Fitzpatrick. I'm from Portland, Oregon. Um, I do hardware hacking. I teach classes on hardware hacking. And I put together this presentation with Joe Grant, who is also named Joe and also lives in Portland, Oregon, and also is a hardware hacker and also does hardware hacking training. Um, between the two of us, we've dealt with lots and lots and lots of devices over the years. Um, and we've hacked a lot of things and we've broken a lot of things in the process of hacking things. So we figured we'd kind of compile all of the stuff we've broken together and make this presentation to teach, teach all of you who may be, you know, hesitant to break hardware that, you know, breaking hardware is just almost as much fun as hacking it. Um, Joe was going to join us, but his work schedule changed, so he wasn't able to join us. So you just get one Joe. One Joe for the price of two or something like that. So we'll go over a few things. First, what is a brick? Um, I use the term a lot, but different people have different meanings when they get to it. And then we'll go through the, the 101 kinds of brick, right? So one, bricking firmware. Two, bricking PCBs. Three, bricking connectors. Four, bricking ICs. And the last one is uh, bricking WTF scenarios where they don't really fall into any other category and you're not really sure what to expect or why they bricked to begin with. And then we'll give a little recap and some be best practices for the most efficient ways to brick your hardware um, and perhaps unbrick it as well. If you're expecting more than five ways of bricking hardware, I apologize. Um, you'll see that we have many examples under each of these categories, but I don't think we actually have 101 total. So what is a brick? You know, obligatory quote from the internet. I just, you know, most people use Wikipedia, but I think that there are other websites that are more accurate because, you know, they're more crowdsourced and less reviewed. So a brick is a pound or kilogram of any drug, um, and I get my dope straight off a brick, okay? Used it in context. So actually, I, I don't know. Is it a kilogram here? Is a brick a kilogram of some sort of drug? I, I guess that like, if you have, it's a unit of measure and you like, take it through customs, is it suddenly like a, an imperial brick or a standard brick or whatever? Um, they actually have a, this is the third definition, brick, um, a verb uh, to brick something. Well, that really helps. This action of rendering any small, medium-sized electronic device useless I would argue that large size devices can be bricked as well. Um, this can happen while changing the firmware, soldering, or any other process involving either hardware or so software. I bricked my mobile phone when I tried to install Linux on it. Hmm. Yeah. You may have even been successful and considered it a brick. Um, so a soft brick is kind of, we're going to the, great, the big, greater categories. A soft brick is where you've messed up the software, sometimes the firmware, because Firmware is this nice little gray area. All the software people say that firmware is hardware, and all us hardware people say that firmware is software. So it's somewhere in between. No one wants to take credit or responsibility for it. So we've messed up the software or the firmware or the hardware or something, and you know, we can just recover this like a phone. You just plug it into iTunes, and iTunes like phones home and makes everything magically better. Um, or you know, Android, you have this update thing where sometimes you can you know, use ADB over a cable to push uh, you know, a new firmware image and you know, recover your phone, just rewipe everything, and suddenly you have a phone that works again. Um, generally, this is a software or configuration problem. You know, there's, a, there's an easy way around it. Like, you usually don't have to solder anything to fix one of these scenarios. Though, you know, if you have a soft brick, they could take it as an excuse or a hint that you should be soldering it. Then there's the hard brick. Um, when you have a hard brick, like, there's, like, there's hardware issues. There's things physically broken. Uh, intentionally or otherwise. There's little or no sign of life. You know, it might not power on, will flash, might, lights might not flash. Um, you probably need to use some soldering and glue and epoxy and maybe just buy something to replace it um, if you've got a hard brick. But we'll talk about different scenarios for that. Oh, back to our five kinds of bricks. We mentioned it before. We'll go first to bricking firmware. So we'll start easy. Like, this, uh, this is, you know, let's check out the, the contents of our firmware.bin, and it seems to be not in good shape. It's all dead. Um, this is basically any scenario where you blank it, you wipe it, you erase it, you corrupt it, or otherwise you invalidate the firmware on your system, so it's just not going to run anymore. So Joe's first example was the DEF CON 18 uh, badge bootloader. He had, this is one of the very early electronic badges. Um, he had an MC56F8. Uh, microcontroller on there, and 
It has Flash on it. You can go and program the Flash. And you know, it's a hacking conference, so everybody's going to go build their firmware and program it. But lots of modern devices have a protected bootloader region. So when you turn on the badge, right, it shows up, and it can wait for information over the serial port over USB to tell it how to update the firmware. It's not on there by default. It has to be programmed with it. Just like the, the 44Com badges this year, they have a bootloader on there so that you can use it as a USB device and you know, just use the Arduino IDE without having to have a dedicated programmer. The problem is this, this bootloader region is not protected. Some devices will lock out that region so you can't erase it without doing something physical. This one was not so lucky. And you could actually uh, have a little a situation where if you had a linker error when you're compiling code for this and then you go to upda update it, it'll actually go and accidentally throw stuff over the bootloader and you won't have, you'll break your bootloader. But uh, luckily there's a way rack back. You know, you use JTAG interface and uh, the development tools, you can re reflash the bootloader and then you have a device that will work over USB again. One of my examples is uh, a Chromebook firmware. Who's used a Chromebook? They're lots of fun, they're really cheap. They are pretty cool because they're one of the few devices that you have that you can actually have a read-only flash chip with your firmware on it, so you know, you're slightly more impervious to BIOS rootkits. But this is Binwalk, which is a tool that will go and uh, walk through your firmware images and find interesting pieces to them. And we see a slight difference between these two. This one, uh, you know, you, this is the entropy, so the randomness of data. If it's really low, it's probably all zeros or all ones. If it's really high, it might be encrypted or compressed. If it's in between, it could be text or it could be um, code, depending on you know, the different levels of entropy. But we see there's a difference here, right? We've got one section that's a whole lot of very high, ent high entropy, yeah, high entropy, and then this area of very low entropy, two different dumps from the same system from different means. Um, this is actually uh, the manageability engine firmware, right, which is an encrypted blob that sits in the BIOS. And uh, if you do a software dump of the BIOS from Flash ROM, your PC is designed to protect you from tampering with the manageability engine firmware and won't let you read it out. And so it gives you all zeros right there. If you go and use a bus pirate or an FTDI chip or something to do a hardware dump of your BIOS, you do get that region. Now, what really gets messy is if you were to go and um, take the software dump you took before tampering with your BIOS and use a hardware programmer to do a hardware write and you blow away this region and suddenly you don't have a manageability engine region and your Chromebook is bricked until you go find one and put it there. So yeah, uh, Chromebooks, I've done a lot of bricking of Chromebooks. So another example, um, you have on the Chromebook a, a pretty well verified secure boot system where you have signed kernels, you have signed file, system, file systems that are mounted as read only. Um, Sometimes you need to go and change something to, you know, change the way it works to test something out or play with something or break something else. Um, so you can mount your read-only file system as read-write, and you make some changes, and you do some stuff, and okay, yeah, what I did worked. I made changes to the file system, and I can do what I want. You reboot the system, the kernel is verified, the kernel boots, kernel checks the root file system, notices that it's not, it's been tampered with since it was signed, and says, sorry, you can't boot this, uh, stick in a recovery key, we're gonna wipe everything and start from scratch. So, you know, you, if you had the ability to take the disk out and go and modify it somewhere else, you could recover that file system, but the Chromebook is pretty neat in the way that it prevents you from tampering with things and protects you from situations where you might have a, a, a tampered system. Um, so moral of the story is keep a backup uh, of things you have on your system, even if it's, you know, uh, your main system and reliable. Uh, you never know when you're going to do something stupid. Uh, speaking of doing something stupid, has anybody ever done this before? Um, so something very simple, like I have done this so many times, I can't believe that I still do it. But like I have a muscle memory. So basically, DD is uh, uh, what? Disk? Disk destroyer. Disk destroyer. Yeah. Um, it's a, a just raw block copies. We have an input file, which is our install ISO, right? which might be like a Linux installer or something, and we want to output it to a USB drive, which would be dev SDB usually, or C or E or F, but sometimes you make a mistake and you put SDA, and in most systems, that's your root file system, like your, your, your boot disk. And you know, you're root, because you gotta be root to, to do this, and um, you're basically taking 700 megabytes of stuff and writing it over the first 700 megabytes of your primary booting disk, which 
will pretty much destroy everything that you have on that system. And it won't happen immediately, and your system will just interestingly start not being able to do things, and then suddenly you'll be like, oh, maybe I'll just reboot. Something's funky. And you reboot, and you don't have a boot sector anymore either, so you're screwed. Um, so just don't accidentally overwrite your primary media. I've done this when working on other systems, you know, trying to put images on the USB drives and, and flash chips and everything. Um, and yeah, it's not fun. What I have now, I actually have a, a, a laptop that has an NVMe disk, uh, non-volatile memory express. It's PCI Express native storage. And so my root file system is actually on dev NVMe 0, or yeah, NVMe, NVMe 0, which means now when I want to copy stuff to a USB drive, I actually have to do this, but my muscle memory really doesn't let me do it. Um, yeah, or you can just wrap it in a script. That way it's a little more reliable. So how do we unbrick our firmware? We have backup copies of everything, and we restore them. We um, directly read and write to the storage media. So sometimes we might have messed up a storage media, and the proper way of using it on the device doesn't work, but we still have the ability to access it through other means by plugging it into a, a system or a card reader or something like that. We might have a recovery or bootloader or download mode. Um, on-chip programming for devices that have firmware built into them, and actually swapping out physical flash devices with a known good one is a good way to get your system back up and running, and also a good way to sanity check to make sure you haven't totally bricked the hardware as well. Speaking of hardware, that's a bricked PCB. Um, so bricking PCBs, that's when we're talking about a little level, low, lower level deeper into the hardware. We're talking about the circuit boards that we're using to do all this stuff. Um, burning, melting, well, delaminating, shorting, scratching, uh, otherwise destroying your PCB and its traces. Yeah, this one, this one broke. Uh, I got angry with it, and it didn't hold up. What's funny to me, though, is actually looking at this, you know, it comes down to maybe half a dozen traces that I actually broke. And this is probably easier to unbrick than most of the other bricks in this talk, even though it looks kind of like someone tore a PCB, um, which is kind of what happened. But anyway, um, so when you're opening up a system and you're poking at things, you find these debug headers, these test headers everywhere, and you want to you solder things to them, it's really convenient to solder headers on them. But sometimes you're really rushed, um, and you're like, oh, man, I just want this to, to desolder. And sometimes your pins are, I don't know if you can see here, you have a little dark green ring with like crosshairs. That's a ground print with what's called thermal bridging, so that when you heat up this spot to get that solder out, you only have to heat up the ring. You don't have to heat up all the metal all around it. But sometimes it doesn't work so well, and you're sitting there, and you just want the solder to melt. And it might be the case where you've, you've got a circuit board that's thick, and the whole thing is full of solder, and you have to get that solder out, and you have to use a solder sucker or a solder wick, and it's just not going fast enough. And you have to do it on all 14 pins, and you have to do it because you have to leave the next day to go use this and a picture in a presentation or teach a class with it. So, you know, you turn the heat all the way up, and you really rush through it, and you try and, like, jab the point of the soldering iron through the hole to just get that solder out of there quickly, and you um, make a mess of things. And I, uh, I don't think you can see it clearly, but this one, basically, the, the, the gold ring has come off. Inside the, two, the hole, there's uh, plate, plating around the inside. That plating is actually right there underneath the tip of the soldering iron, no longer in the hole. So, yeah. I think the moral of the story is be patient and calm down and just, just do it right the first time. Um, or if you need to, find someone else who's patient and ask them to do it for you. Um, you're you're going to have uh, a better luck doing it right than breaking several of these and not doing it right. So another case where I had a device I wanted to rip apart. This is a pogo plug. It's a little. Uh, network attached storage device where you plug your, hard, your USB hard drives into it and you plug it onto your network and you can like share your files. And this was a novel idea a few years ago before like, I don't know, before everything, like you, you, had sta you have now have standalone hard drives that you just plug into the network, which is kind of cool. I was looking for stuff on the CPU. I figured there had to be JTAG traces somewhere. I knew the CPU had JTAG. I knew which pins on the CPU had JTAG, but I couldn't find any test points that were uh, relevant. So poking around for a while, looking at the board, I just decided, like, OK, if there are any de test points on this board for JTAG, they're routing underneath the chip. So I need to like, take the chip off. So you see this square here? That's where the, the CPU was. If we look down in this corner right here, you see those lines. Some over here, these, these little round things, those vias, those are holes that are underneath the CPU. So you can't see them until you take the CPU off. I wanted to see those. So I sit there with the hot air gun, waiting patiently impatiently. 
uh, for the chip to come off. And I'm like, you know, okay, well, this side's almost hot, and so I, you know, I get an uh, exacto knife and stick it under, and I start prying it up, and like a couple legs come up, and it's really hot, so the plastic case of the, the chip starts, de you know, bending a little bit. And I really, I didn't care that I was going to destroy this thing because it cost me maybe $15. But I sit there and I keep trying and I finally get like one corner up and another corner up and finally I'm just patient enough for, finally, what it is is it just, it's going to take a certain amount of time for everything to melt anyway. So all the time I spent prying corners up didn't matter anyway because I could have just sat there doing nothing because the whole chip was going to be hot enough to just pick up off at once at one point anyway. The point is in the process over here, I scratched the board up quite a bit and cut a few traces. So even if I did like, have the patience to take it off cleanly, I would not be able to put it back on because I would have to repair the PCB before I put the chip back on and expected it to work again. Again, um, in this case, it was worth it. I found out that there actually were no test points attached to JTAG, JTAG which kind of decided, oh, well, I guess I can move on. I'll just solder wires to the pins instead of all this extra work. Um, and in the end, it was worth it. You know, I, I did destroy a $15 piece of hardware, but I got a piece of information that I would have had to take a lot more time any other way to get. So this is a, uh, a Hirsch scramble pad. Um, and actually, I don't believe there's a picture of the pad itself. This is one of those uh, keypad entry systems, but each button is a little uh, seven-segment display. So you, you know your PIN number to get in, but your PIN number, all the numbers scramble every time you press a digit. So you don't have this issue where you have like the, 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 the combo bo button that has like one, two, three, and four with all the text rubbed off because that's what everybody presses to get in. And the other keys are like brand pristine new. So Joe was doing this. This is his entry system to his, his office. And uh, he was measuring the voltage to the LM7805, this chip over here. And you know, you sit there with your probes and you're like plucking, plugging things and trying to measure voltages, figuring out why things aren't working. And, Oops, um, yeah, when you touch things that have power in them, input or output, um, things spark. So he shorted it out, he burnt the board a bit, um, sparked, uh, it didn't destroy the chip or the board. I think he may have blown a fuse, but whatever. Um, so the moral of the story is sometimes you, you burn things or break things and you, know, you are lucky and it doesn't totally brick itself. But we did find a way to break this later on. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, who, here, who here has ever done any hardware hacking? Um, so when you think of hardware hacking, what kind of devices do you think of? Routers. Routers are like a good starting point, right? So this is the Food Saver V800, or 850, sorry. Um, everybody, everybody ever thought about hardware hacking their, their Food Saver V850? This is the little vacuum seal thing you have in the kitchen. You put stuff in, it sucks the air out, and like, yeah. So don't, don't dismiss anything neat, um, anything electronic, or even anything non-electronic from like, your purvey of what you expect to hack. Um, just be careful, because this is the circuit board out of the Food Saver V850. And all the way over here on this circuit board, you have this really thin trace. right? And you look at all the other traces on this PCB, and they're fat. Usually the fatter PCBs are the power PCB, or, sorry, fatter traces are the power traces. And the thin traces are like the data traces because they don't need as much current going through. But all the way over here, there's a power supply that goes through a really thin trace. And that's just a really uh, 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 a poor designer's way of making a fuse. Right? If too much current goes through here, it'll burn. Um, so yeah, when you start messing around with things, taking them apart, putting them back together, and you try and um, measure an AC signal with like uh, equipment that is not made to uh, measure AC signals, like you use an oscilloscope. OK, your oscilloscope is tied to ground, um, plugged into the wall. This device was plugged into AC and had only, 200, only 110 volts, not 220. But still, like, you know, there's, there's, there's something going on. So what, what do you think happens when you get a, gro a grounded device and touch it to something that has 120 volts? And what um, happens? Bang! OK. <laughs> so boom. Um, this is uh, Dave from EEV blog, and he has this kind of explanation where everything is, if when you have things that are plugged into the ground, into like mains ground, right, you have to realize you're going to loop grounds together at some point in time. So you, we had an oscilloscope and a food saver, and they were both grounded, and we touched things together, and we were now shorting with 120 volts, and bam. So moral of the story, uh, be careful. <laughs> 
So unbricking your PCBs. So careful in soldering can work go very far. This fuse that was missing, right, or that was burnt out, it would be pretty trivial to go and like solder a wire from this point to this point once that trace has been blown. You would lose the uh, fuse protection and capabilities of that trace, but hopefully you won't make the same mistake twice. And what happened? Cause, yeah, because why? Oh. And what happens? Bang! <laughs> um, so blue wires. Um, yeah, so you can just, you know, when you, when you cut or break a trace, just put a little blue wire in there, connect things around, fix them, make them work together. Epoxy and adhesives are really great if you have a board that's bent, broken, burned, um, and needs to be repaired. You know, once you make it flat again, then you can put your wires on top of it, and it might be, be better again. Or really, you could just be very patient um, in the first place. That's probably the best approach. So that's it for PCBs, but we have a lot of components on PCBs. Um, particularly connectors. Um, anybody dealt with a, a, a flaky connector before? Anybody recognize what's going on here? Yeah. Um, so damaging power plugs, breaking solder joints, crushing internal connectors, severing internal cables, and having just cable, cables and connectors that get worn, bent, uh, and just don't make the connectivity they, they're supposed to that result in horrible, horrible things like the flashing red light on your Nintendo. Um, that was when you, you know, for, for all you little kids, um, that was when you had a cartridge. It's what games used to come on. And you put it in a slot, and you push it down, and it didn't make good connectivity. So the light would flash, and you'd open it up, and you'd take it out, and you go <laughs> and like try and blow all the dust out. And it usually didn't work, and you put it back in, and it would flash again. And you like in and out, in and out. You like, push it, it makes a lot of noise, and it still doesn't work. And then you get the Game Genie, and you plug your game in the Game Genie, and the Game Genie into the Nintendo, and that made better connectivity, because the Game Genie had a really thick connector on the end. Yeah. Ever heard of Game Genie? OK, good. Uh, so other connectors. Uh, we've, I've talked a lot about Chromebooks. I, I have a lot of them. I use them for my classes. Um, and they're kind of, well, they were sort of expensive. They were like 200 bucks each, which is not expensive. But as the model I use kind of went out of production, they were available much cheaper, um, like $100, $120 each. So that's pretty affordable, because I have 30 of them that I use for classes. Um, but, you know, occasionally they, they wear out, they break, the screen breaks, something happens. So I want to have a couple spares because they're not in production anymore. And so I was like, oh, wow, I can, uh, I found on eBay someone selling, like, uh, does not work, does not power on ones. I'm like, well, what could be the problem? There's not that many components inside. So I said, what the heck? I ordered 10 Chromebooks for $350, so 35 bucks each. And of the 10 of them, one of them had a broken screen, so a cracked screen. And nine of them had this loose connector inside the monitor. So you, you, you lift up the display, you open it up, it hinges up, you close it, you open it, you close it. There's a little cable that runs through that hinge up into the display. And that's this cable right here. And it goes over to this connector over here. And if you can see it on the right side, it's stuck out by like a millimeter. And just over time, over lots of opening and closing and maybe a little dropping and shaking too, um, this connector gets loose. And it gets just loose enough that the screen doesn't turn on. And when the screen doesn't turn on, most people will throw it out um, or sell it on eBay. And so I bought them on eBay. And I turned uh, 10 dead on arrival laptops into nine functioning ones and a whole bunch of spare parts, which I ended up using when I had a bad battery in one of the other ones. So all I had to do was open this up, peel the tape off, plug it back in, and put the tape back on with a little extra. And done. So sometimes the moral is you, sometimes you can brick a device just from normal use. So this is a documented issue with this model of Chromebook. Um, I have a lot of Chromebooks. Eventually, some of them stop working because they get used a lot, opened and closed. Um, sometimes bricks happen even when you weren't actually even hacking something more than you normally should. But you can use hacking techniques to fix it, which is great. Uh, more, more missing connectors. Um, this is a, a little mini PC. Um, it's like maybe four inches by two inches or three inches by two inches. Um, it's the same processor that Intel uses in a lot of their, their cheap tablets. Um, but it gets power over this mini USB connector, right? Uh, or sorry, micro USB connector. And it's kind of a silly idea to use that, in my opinion, because the traces and the component were not really well designed for high current. And you know, it is a mini PC, but it still uses a sufficient amount of current. It had a three amp power supply. Um, normally, when you use these for your phone, it's like 1.2 amps or maybe 2 amps for like the high power, like tablets and stuff. 3 amps is a bit large. And 
It was a very poorly soldered component. It didn't have any uh, strain relief. Um, it just stopped working. So um, at high CPU utilization, the whole thing would heat up. And when the whole thing heats up, the board deforms a tiny bit and would lose connection, and it would power off. And it would stay powered off no matter what you did until it cooled off, and then it would have a good power connection again, and then it would work again. So I bypassed that and just soldered it directly to the regulator and ground. And it works now. And it still gets really hot, but it doesn't turn off. So maybe I broke something else. Um, or maybe, maybe I'm setting myself to up to have something else break. But oh well. So I, I give uh, micro USB a hard time sometimes, but micro USB is great. You know USB A, the rectangular, or sorry, the, yeah, the rectangular, no, the square ones, right? And oh, uh, A is the rectangular, B is the square ones, mini B is like the ones that have like a little hat kind of shape, and then micro are the almost oval ones. Micro connectors are rated for 10,000 insertions. Mini and regular are only made, rated for about 500 insertion cycles. And the reason why is, see how here there's a little hole there and a little hole there? There's little metal clips on the cable, and those are the things that break first, right? The, the, the mechanical parts are what break on a cable. So cables are only rated for 500 insertion cycles. The connector is rated for 10,000. So what are you going to replace more often? The cable. It actually makes sense. What doesn't make sense is how many of these things are just surface mount with very little um, reinforcement. Solder is never, ever, 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 ever supposed to be uh, physical reinforcement for anything. It's only for electrical connectivity. And you know, if you, if you had a through-hole connector on here, even though the, the, the data pins would be surface mount, if you had a through-hole connector, this thing might stay still a little better. Or a through-hole connector that has like a, a big piece of metal that like locks in place. But this doesn't. It also has a hole. This is the, the end of a tablet. Tablet? Yeah, TW700 tablet. It has a tablet. It has a hole in the plastic where this connector sticks out, and it's not flush around the edges. So there's a little wiggle room in there. So when you go and plug this in to charge and you let it sit, if you move it a little bit too much or you, know, do you, you charge it too many times, this connector starts to wobble, and these solder joints right here start to break. And you can kind of barely see them here where there's like, you see, it looks like there's a line straight across there. That's where this connector has been like loose and lifted up and started breaking. Um, but yeah, surface mount connectors have really poor mechanical stability. Solder is not designed to handle mechanical stress. The solution to this was to just go at it with a hot air gun and hold it on there and then blob epoxy all over it. And then it worked for a little while longer. The problem with the epoxy is once you put it on, like, you better have it fixed because you're not getting that stuff off. Luckily, they're cheap tablets. So you know, instead of, if, it, if you do brick one, they're like 50 bucks. Um, so slicing internal cables, I do this a lot. Um, this is another Acer Chromebook, the CB3. It has USB and audio running over a flexible printed circuit to one side. So you have your, your main board inside of this laptop is all, actually this is on its side. The main board is all the way up here, and you have your power connector and a bunch of stuff on one side. Then you have empty space, and then you have this flexible cable that connects over to here to the other stuff. And I um, was taking it apart, and it was the first time I opened it up. I wasn't sure where pieces were, and I'm used to the motherboard and this expansion board being on the same side. The motherboard in this thing was actually attached to the bottom of the keyboard. So it came off, and there was this ribbon cable connecting, and I pulled a little bit too hard. And this real ribbon cable, which is folded right here, I just tore it a little bit right there. Sometimes, if you're lucky, it'll rip it right out of the connector. Um, hopefully, you can find the spot where it goes back in. When you're not lucky, you break the cable. And I'm always amazed how ridiculously expensive like replacement flexible printed circuits are. Um, they're like. I don't understand why they're so expensive. It's just a piece of plastic, but whatever. Um, so opening the case without knowing uh, where it is uh, either disconnects the cable, which is good, or causes the cable to kink and tear, which is bad. Um, again, patience is what you need to do to figure this out. Get things open, peek inside, look around before you go and like, oh, oh it's open, and rip it open. Um, so I mean, this is a low-cost consumer device. And without any comment, this is a high-cost consumer device, which also has a very similar cable which in this case is broken. If any of you recognize this consumer device, then shh. Um, yeah, this was something that broke while it was being disassembled to be hacked. And um, there's this really great solution for when you, when you brick something. Um, if you just bought it, and you're really careful when you take things apart, you just put it back together and return it. And like, yeah, it just didn't work. Um, it sometimes works. Um, mechanical reinforcement. Um, is really helpful for unbricking this kind of stuff. You, you've got a connector 
you broke the connector, you broke the cable, you broke the PC, you need to get stuff back together. You need to get the wires in the right spots. Electrical reinforcement, so throwing on more solder, using a heavier gauge wire is helpful. Knowing how to measure and locate replacements is really helpful because if you have like calipers, you can measure. You know the pitch of the pins, you know the length of the part, you know how far apart the, the holes and connectors are. So you can go and um, look on DigiKey as my preferred site just because they ship to me within two days for like really low rates. I don't know if Farnell is the, the, the supplier of choice here or someone else. Um, they all, DigiKey also doesn't have like minimum order sizes and they don't have processing fees. So I really love DigiKey. So DigiKey is my friend. Um, and knowing how to read the mechanical drawings so you know the footprint of what you're trying to replace and how to replace it is a pretty, pretty useful set of skills. Onward. So we're on type number four. Uh, bricking integrated circuits. Um, so connectors are one category of devices that is pretty, has some special considerations. Integrated circuits are, we're getting closer to like the lower level of what, does, what are the brains of things. So when we start bricking things here, it works a little bit different. Um, usually the case is we've exceeded the absolute maximum ratings and we let out the magic smoke. Um, if you look at any data sheet for any device, it's going to have a section over here that says absolute maximum stress ratings. So don't ever uh, store this device below negative 65 degrees Celsius or above 150 because something bad might happen. It might stop working. Uh, don't ever operate it below 55 or above 125. Don't ever put more than a certain amount of voltage on any pin. Don't ever try to dissipate more than a one full watt of power. And when you're soldering it, you can solder it at up to 260 degrees, but only for 10 seconds, and then you should pre take the heat away. So all of these, um, these ratings are telling you how to use the part and not have it stop functioning. Um, but whatever, who, who reads those anyway? You usually read those after the fact when you've bricked it and you wonder why. Um, so this is another tablet I was poking at, the Techlast X98 1.8 volts uh, uh, tablet. It's a Windows tablet that I bought from China, which um, uses Intel Bay, Tra Bay Trail CPU, the same as that little mini PC. Um, but that CPU, everything is 1.8 volt. Um, and nearly everything in the hobbyist world is like 3.3 volts, even older stuff is 5 volts. So a lot of the tools we use are 3.3 volts. And, I, I oftentimes go in and just use the tools that I have without really thinking about this, like this situation. So I went and hooked up my spy flash reader to this Bay Trail tablet, and I tried to read the BIOS and um, got garbage, and then the tablet didn't turn on. And that really didn't help. Um, so if you're going at a system with too much voltage, right, you're overvolting the chip. Um, in this case, I was overvolting the chip as well as the chipset because I was supplying power. So I could have fried the CPU itself. Um, I could have just messed up the, the flash chip. When you, get, when you try and write it with too high a voltage, it just writes garbage to it. I was luckily I was able to get it out and hook up this mess of wires where I have a Beagle One Black, which is a little single board computer that has a SPI connection on it. I connect the SPI pins to this board, which has a chip on it, which is a level shifter. It takes my 3.3 volts and brings it down to 1.8 volts. And then over here I have a socket where I put in the SPI flash chip that I desoldered and put it in the socket. I go, I can identify the chip, I can write the flash to it properly. Then I take it and put it back in the system and solder it in and the system boots again. So um, using the right voltage levels uh, is a good idea and you can find that in the data sheet if you look for the data sheet before you brick it. And if you already bricked it, you can find it in the data sheet and figure out what you did wrong. USB is pretty neat. Um, Lots of things hook up to it. This is a USB to serial adapter, a very, very cheap one, probably a counterfeit one. But uh, this is based on uh, a counterfeit prolific PL2303, uh, similar to the FTDI boards. You plug it in, shows up, install a driver, and now you have serial port. Um, poor build quality caused an overcurrent condition that wasn't detected by the host USB port. Normally, if you have a USB device that draws more than 500 milliamps, your port should turn it off. Not sure why this didn't happen. Maybe it was too little too slowly. Um, normally the problem is like you hook up the, the red wire which is power and the, green, the black wire which is ground, you hook those up to your Arduino board or something else that you're programming and if you accidentally touch those together, you're drawing current and you're throwing it back down the other way and you're, just, you're, you're getting things hot. It could have also been, because it, it's centered around here and there's nothing significant around here, it could have been just like a blob of solder that was left on the board when it, from manufacturing and it just shorted something out and melted. 
But I went and I couldn't figure out why this board wasn't working. I kept like trying to connect to that serial port and it would just return nothing even when I looped it back. And then I go to pull it out and my finger sinks into molten plastic. Like, oh, okay, yeah, something's going on here. And opened up and the board is a little bit toasty. Luckily they only cost a dollar, so I threw it out and got another one from the bag of 50 that I have. Um, 50 is a good number because you get shipping discounts when you buy 50 of them. And you go through them when they're the cheap counterfeits. Um, so here we have another situation where you draw too much current. This is uh, an LDO regulator, a uh, low voltage dropout regulator. And the point is, you, you know, get, I forget what this one specifically was. This is one of Joe's projects. You, know, you get 5 volts in and you get 3.3 volts out. And it has a circuitry to regulate that to exactly 3.3 volts. Now they had built a system and they'd spec a chip from a certain manufacturer and availability changed so they went and they got the C word one instead of the, you know, brand Y uh, chip. And all was well and good, the pinout was the same, but on this little chip, this tab up here, right, that is supposed to be like for thermal purposes. That's supposed to like diffuse the heat from the chip. The middle pin was the one that actually was supposed to be the voltage supply. Um, on the, the other board that they had, the other chip that they had used, those two pins were connected internally and very, very tightly coupled, so it was fine that they used this one for their voltage output. On this one, it was not. They were both the same voltage output, but you see a very tiny trace right here. Um, that tiny trace is what outputs the voltage here as a reference output. Um, this one is connected to the very big driver at the bottom that is supposed to be able to, to supply, you know, one amp of, of current. Um, so because they had designed their board with a different chip in mind, and even though this chip sort of looked like it worked on an oscilloscope, after lots of use, it just fried the thing. So in terms of unbricking your PCs, your ICs, when you brick an IC, there's really no going back. I mean, there, there's no sense in going and thinning and decapping a chip and like editing it with a fib tool or something like that. You, you just replace the chip. That's the way to do it. It's important though, if you have a board issue that caused your chip to fry or some other situation, fix that first before you go and buy a new chip and solder it in the socket and power on the system and have the second one fry the same way. Um, once again, DigiKey or Farnell or anyone else is your friend. Um, hopefully it's a chip that you can readily find and get in quantity. Um, when you order one, don't order one, order two or five or 10 or 100 because you'll use it and if you don't use it now, you'll use it later. Hmm. So, breaking WTF scenarios. We're kind of wondering WTF is going on here. Um, what is that big thing anyway? Um, when environmental conditions and physical factors gang up against your devices. So, when you brick stuff, you just make stuff not work. Um, sometimes the environment makes the stuff not work for you. Uh, you don't have to go and do anything special, you know, the phases of the moon, the weather, something's gonna make it stop for you. In this example, this is, this is someone else's photo, but like I've played with a couple of these AT&T microcells. Um, this is a little, this is one of the very early, like, you know, plug this into your home network and it'll create a cell access point so you can get cell service in your apartment that doesn't have cell signal. Um, of course, what do you do when you get something like this? You take it apart, but they know that. They actually like thought about this, which is impressive. They didn't think about it too much though. Um, and they said, oh, well, well, we'll put this little plastic thingy on here. So when you pull the case open, it's stuck on this and it pulls that little plastic shim off and these jumpers fall off. And there's one on each side. And so when you do that, you've, you've, you've taken something off and it's not as simple as just, just three jumpers because some of these jumpers are blanks and some of them are actual jumpers. And you don't actually know which configuration they went in because there could be I believe six configurations of the jumpers on each side. And if you don't notice that, if you just pull it off and you're like, oh wow, these extra pieces fell out, and you plug it in and you connect, it actually like phones home and says the device has been tampered with. And if you do that, you just call them up and say, yeah, I don't know, I, I mean I dropped, the UPS delivered it and they dropped it really hard, so maybe that was what happened. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll, we'll just clear the, clear the alert on your account. Um, so yeah. There's stuff like this that, um, the, in this case, it didn't brick the hardware, it just modified how it worked, so it, it wouldn't work until you called them and they cleared that flag on your account. But there's scenarios where you could use stuff like this to, oh, this has been tampered with, let's wipe the firmware, stop working. This is the Verifone PinPad 1000SE, um, yet another device. Uh, this is, um, 
So it has, uh, you know, when you, when you deal with something that's dealing with payment, you usually want the money to go where you want it to go, so you don't want people tampering with it. So this device has a couple different uh, devices, parts to, to detect intrusion. Um, it has this whole extra PCB that sits over the top, protecting all the critical components. Um, it has uh, a switch that's triggered when you open it up. It has an active mesh PCB. So basically, the capacitance of the stuff on here is known and measured in operation. And if you take it off while it's live, it knows that you did that because it knows that the, the load on those pins has changed. So there's a, some electrical characteristics that it knows what's going on. And of course, it says tampered device alarm physical, press a key. Um, so at this point, you have to re-enable it. Um, sometimes that's easy. You know, you just have to turn it off, put it back together, turn it on again, and it works fine. Sometimes you might have to clear something in firmware, which means tampering with firmware. Sometimes you have, like, math and cryptography that makes it even more complicated. But that's someone else's problem. Math is hard. More environmental conditions. This is Joe's um, Parallax RFID module. So this device, it, it, uh, you can buy it from Parallax. Joe designed it to be just a, a generic RFID reader uh, based on a Parallax chip. Um, and he had it for a while, and it was serial-based, and he wanted to make it a USB-based one. And just you know, did exactly what you would do. You'd have a USB to serial adapter. But for some reason, you know, he did, did captures. Serial one worked fine. USB one did not. And it's not just a, a shift, as it might seem. That, I mean, you get good data either way. Um, but what happened is when you were using a USB uh, device, it was using USB for power, and it was uh, pretty unclean power. Um, so the noise on the USB power supply was demodulated as data. And so for quite a while, Joe was kind of mixed up on this because like, he would just get these random packets of data that made no sense, couldn't figure out where they were, couldn't capture them on an oscilloscope. The final solution, just changing the value of a capacitor was enough to filter out all that noise and make it so the USB version of the, the, the RFID reader worked fine. Go figure. Those capacitors actually do do something. Sometimes. So this is a, a very different project that I worked on. This is a, an AR sandbox. Um, I just took someone else's design, uh, plan, like software and stuff, and built a box full of sand. It uses a connect to depth map the sand and a projector to project terrain on the sand. But what would happen is I was at a, a, a hacker camp, tour camp, which is a really fun camp. And um, I had it set up outside. And I had set it up outside before at home without any problems. But the first night, everybody was you know, drunk, playing with LEDs and sandboxes and whatever else was there. And the next morning, I go, and it doesn't work. And I'm trying to figure out why it doesn't work. And this is just an example. I would have these splotches of black um, where there's just no, no data for depth, and I couldn't figure out why. And it was actually almost the whole thing. It was only at the very edges. Whoops. Uh, I don't know what happened. But uh, what I would do is, how's my time? OK. Um, as I was like, OK, well, it was out overnight. I mean, this is the Pacific Northwest, maybe humidity. Um, there might be a reading problem. I have another backup connect. I plug in a backup connect. That doesn't work either. OK, so it's not the connect, which I thought was what the breaking problem was. And then I'm like, oh, there's other stuff to do. I got distracted, saw some shiny thing. And then it worked fine that night. So I'm like, oh, whatever. And then uh, the next day, it doesn't work again. And I couldn't figure out why. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe if I, there's something going on. I, set, I changed the clock on the, on the system just to see if like, it was something time-based, but it wasn't. Um, turns out this thing is, uh, the connect is very, uh, it uses infrared light to do its work. Um, and it generally doesn't work well in the sunlight. I had no problem at home because I had a black sheet over it, and it was in direct sunlight. When I went to tour camp, it was in direct sunlight with a black sheet over it. And the black sheet has like threads going in both directions, and it makes a little cross hatching of dots, of infrared light dots, all over the sand, which is exactly what the Kinect does. So it wasn't actually a brick. It was just a matter of the sun causing bad things to happen. So speaking of optical and, and photonics, um, lots of silicon is light sensitive, and it can and be subject to a photoelectric effect where you, know, you basically have a photon that turns into an electron and causes voltage to happen. Um, this can be used uh, unintentionally or intentionally. Um, you may have heard the Raspberry Pi 2 when you, is that a 2? OK. Yeah, the Raspberry Pi 2, when you take a picture of it, Right? Your flash goes off, and it shorts out one of the power regulators. It glitches it. 
And so your Raspberry Pi resets. And it's like, ah, uh, oops. Um, so another example, and you can do this intentionally. So this is a device, uh, a flash chip with, I don't actually know if this was an EEPROM or actually just a hole drilled into it. But if you know exactly what you want to erase in flash, you can actually use a laser and erase just the bits you want. If you have a microcontroller that has like flash readout disabled in a fuse, right, you can go and get that device and thin the top and go and find that fuse and, and erase that fuse. And suddenly you can read the flash, the, the stored uh, information on that flash chip. Um, and remember the, the scramble pad that I mentioned before that Joe had like touched with uh, his multimeter probes and shorted it out and it, flat, it sparked, but it, it still worked? Well, for this presentation, we were getting stuff together. And Joe goes and he takes a picture of it. And he's like, okay, I got the picture. We put it in the presentation. Like, oh, let's, let's go grab lunch. We leave. We come back after lunch. And he's trying to like put his combo in. And like, nothing's working. Like, there's no lights. Like, wait a minute, what's going on? So it turns out, in the process of making a presentation about bricking your hardware, Joe managed to brick his scramble pad by taking a picture of it and erasing some of the flash that was on there. So, all these WTF scenarios. You might not know what you did that caused the brick. Um, get another piece of hardware and be more careful. Um, get another piece of hardware and just kind of do a manual diff. Find the, the, the components that are the same or different. Find the flash and the firmwares that are the same or different. Um, go out to eat, have lunch, get distracted. Maybe it'll work that night and you won't have to worry about it. It's not actually a brick, it's just a, a messed up system. So in summary, what are the best ways to brick a system? Um, bricking your firmware, you know, make sure you have, you, 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 yeah, sorry, best ways to brick. Brick your firmware, just wipe it. Put a zeros in your flash and it's not gonna work. The best way to brick your PCBs, go in there and tear it to pieces. Cut your traces, scratch it up. Um, when you have your connectors, right, uh, try ripping the connectors off, pulling up traces with it. Um, smash them so that you don't have good connectivity. Stick things that are too big into your connectors so that they don't make good contact when they're in the right way. Uh, integrated circuits, the easiest way to do that is just give them bad voltage, too much voltage. And something that's particularly helpful, lots of devices are protected against high voltage, but if you flip the voltage around and instead of applying five volts to a 3.3 volt, you apply negative five volts, it's much more catastrophic. Um, have you guys heard of the USB killer? So they, they just started selling them. It's an interesting idea. I have played with similar devices, and they, they do work. Um, but they, their device, so you plug it in, and it charges up capacitors, and then spits out negative 120 volts on your data lines. Negative 15 is all you need. You don't need to go any beyond that. Um, but their, their device, it does it on the data lines um, so that it just destroys the USB functionality. It doesn't always destroy the whole chip. If you want to really destroy the system, you put negative 15 volts on the power supply line, then the whole thing stops working. And you can return it and say it doesn't work and you don't know why. Um, bricking WTF scenarios. The best way to make something not work in one of these scenarios is wait till the last minute to work on it, because it won't work then. And you won't have the time to figure out why. So that's great. You know, we should probably talk a little bit about how to avoid it. Um, with firmware, back up your firmware so you're prepared in case you do brick it. With your PCBs, just have, have a workspace that's set up properly and use protective measures, right? If you do things right and patiently, you're not going to destroy stuff in the process, even when you start like using hot air to disassemble entire boards and stuff like that. Um, with connectors, again, use the right tools. Um, when you have a, a ribbon cable connector, use the right tool. Use like one of those little hook things to lift the lever and slide it out. Don't just yank it out. Um, and with the ICs, you know, double check your pinouts, check your voltages, read the manual before you brick it. Um, and having a predictable setup for these WTF scenarios. You know, if you always do something in the same way in the same place, it should have fewer variables that you have to worry about. It does make it difficult when you go and like move it to the other table and everything stops working. You have to figure out what, but that's, you can always go back to the known good scenario. Um, it's really helpful to have that set up. Of course, it does happen. We do brick things on purpose and by accident. Um, if you have bricked firmware, you have a backup. Restore it. Um, if you have PCBs you've destroyed, use your soldering skills or find someone with soldering skills. Find a friend, uh, pay someone. It's worth it, usually. Um, 
connectors or integrated circuits, when you've destroyed a, a, a piece, it's usually not uh, feasible to go and repair that little piece or th even 3D print some of them. They're so small. So knowing how to find devices and replace them and order them is really a helpful uh, approach. Um, and these WTF scenarios, like, don't hack what you can't afford to lose. Um, so just consider, like, oh, if you have a laptop that you use for, like, personal stuff and work and everything else, that's probably not the one you should do hardware hacking on, just because. Um, but it's really easy to come by cheap, old, used, broken things. So, you know, try your hardware hacking on broken stuff first as opposed to using it on fully functional new stuff as well. Or not. I mean, depends, depends on how much you trust your skills and how, how much you can rationalize an expense. So what's the benefit of all this, right? The sacrificial brick is kind of the best one. It's like when you have a system, you want to find out more about it, you can say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brick this system. I'm going to rip it apart. I'm going to do a destructive disassembly of it, and I'm going to learn something from that, and it's going to be worth it. Um, when you make your mistakes, learn from them. It's really helpful to do them at someone else's expense. So someone says, hey, can you help me hack my, my car? Don't touch the CAN bus, but you can help me hack my car. Come on and everybody come do it. That's the opportunity you use, because then you can hack someone else's car, and if you break it, they say, like, hey, you asked me to do it. Um, share your mistakes so others can avoid them. If you've bricked something, um, and you, you did something that you didn't expect that was going to brick it, yeah, write it up. Write a blog post. I mean, these are like the best pieces of information, because someone else is going to go and try and work on that same thing or something similar. And like, oh, wow, I should avoid you know, uh, flipping the voltage or taking a picture of this EEPROM or other things like that. So um, in the end, apparently, you can make a whole presentation about bricking. So if you have your, your, uh, your plan, step one, brick a lot of hardware. Step three, profit. Um, not sure what step two is, but uh, thank you for watching. And if anybody has any questions, let me know. <laughs>